Hello everyone, welcome to the episode 11 of our podcast. Uh, today um, we have a different setup. Uh, usually we do the podcast uh, online. Uh, today we are physical in our studio. Uh, so um, we are changing the format a little bit as well. So Sanjeev is going to be the moderator. And we have a special guest. Usually you don't call family members as guests. Uh, so our guest is like a, a family member for WSO2. Uh, so, and our podcast as well. So Sanjeev is going to take over from there. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest. Again, not really a guest. Uh, so Paul Fremantle is co-founder of WSO2. And I have known Paul, I think, from 1998. Uh, when I was in IBM Research, he was in IBM Software Group. And we worked on a bunch of stuff together in IBM, uh, was in fact part of the effort that uh, precursors WSO2 mul in multiple steps. One was around open source, around the Lanka Software Foundation and the Apache Access 2 project. Paul was one of the founders of that. Paul was also uh, later on one of the founders of Apache Synapse, uh, which is what uh, is the foundation of the, our microintegrator product to the state. And uh, Paul was in uh, UK and I was in New York and then I came back to Sri Lanka and eventually we ended up starting WSO2 because we couldn't get anybody. Uh, we were both leading this Apache Access 2 project and we went around saying somebody should start a business on this because there's something to be had with this thing and nobody was interested and we finally said, why are we telling everybody else to do this? We should go do this. And we said, okay, well, then we go figure it out. And that's how we ended up starting WC2. Then in the middle of that, the tsunami struck Sri Lanka. We actually, well, before that, December 21st, 2004, we had a secret meeting in, in UK, in, in Paul's mother's apartment in Battersea, in London. And uh, we kind of schemed WC2 at that time. Uh, there was two of us and another person. We were, we were all working for IBM. Therefore, it was a secret meeting. But it was on our own time and our own budget, just in case IBM auditors are looking at this. Um, and we uh, sketched out the company and took a while to raise money and so on. But August uh, 4th is our official birthday, but there were lots of time milestones in between and started the company. And this week is special because we are having, uh, and Paul, we are, we are gathered in Colombo actually today, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Paul is also here, Asanka is here because we are celebrating the end of version one of WSO2. And sort of the beginning of version two, and we have a uh, we have some events going on this week, and we have a party on Thursday night. So it's great that Paul is here, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about some interesting stuff. So before I, uh, I uh, before I talk more about the sort of you know what we've done in WS Group, maybe Paul, you can say a few things. Sure. So yeah, it's really nice to be here with both of you. Um, uh, I, I'm, as I say, I, I know Sanjeeva. So so my memory of meeting Sanjeeva was. I was writing a book on XML and I'd somehow created this funky setup where you could generate XML from, from a web app and then automatically apply an XSL filter to it to generate your web page. So you could have an XML based web app in, uh, in 1998, which was pretty, pretty leading. And um, uh, it didn't work. There was a bug. I found a bug in the XSL code. And in IBM in those days, if you found a bug, there was a, some ghastly version of an error reporting system on a mainframe. No one knew how to use. You had to have special credentials. You couldn't just raise a, raise a GitHub issue. And uh, anyway, so I just wrote an email to the email address attached to this library. And the next morning, Sanjeeva wrote back with, hey, I've fixed your bug. Here's a, here's a new library. And it worked. And I was like, that is not normal IBM behavior. So I was pretty impressed. So that's my memory of meeting Sanjeeva. Um, so we talked on the phone and we got really excited about a whole bunch of XML stuff. And then we got excited about gateways. We, we Sanjeeva failed to mention that we basically built the first internet gateway. The first, unfortunately, IBM took so long to take it to market that one of our competitors shipped the first gateway, but we, we had it up on a, on a, a alpha site called AlphaWorks before anyone else. So I, I think, and we actually have a patent on it. So, so API gateways uh, go back a long way. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about cell based architecture, which I think is a really nice subject. Um, I worked on it a lot with Asanka a few years ago and, um, uh, I, 
you probably don't know, I, I given up that kind of stuff and I'm making musical instruments, which is a different story for another podcast. But, um, but I, I feel very strongly about cell based architecture. So they wrote me in to, to, to talk about some of the history of it. And then, uh, we'll talk about the future and where it's going as well. Yeah, so I think before getting to the topic, I would like to say a few things about uh, Paul as well and this moment because this is very special. Um, it's, we are starting the uh, second phase of our V2 and then sitting with Sanjeeva and Paul is special for me. Uh, those are These two are my mentors and, um, and Paul became a friend after he kind of... Uh, uh, move away from WS2 a little bit and um, since Sanjeev is my boss I can't speak certain th things with him <laughs> then all this I go to Paul when it comes to uh, get an advice on non-work related stuff uh, and a lot of history that we did uh, yeah, like well, great uh, projects together and a lot of wins and uh, great memories. Wouldn't I interviewed you yes. in, no, was it the Cinnamon Grand Lobby? Yes, it was Cinnamon and Grand Lobby. That must have been, what, 15 years um, ago or something? Yeah, like it that? was uh, 2008 April. There we go. So, yeah, a long time ago. And yeah. it was like, uh, I was really impressed. So it was, and it, Turned out I was right, so that was good. <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> was interesting lucky. because uh, Sanjeev, uh, when I met Sanjeev, he didn't ask a single technical question from me during the interview. And then uh, the second I met Paul, and that was very interesting uh, we had conversation. A great, we had a great technical conversation, I remember, yeah. 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 All right, so we're going to, we're here to talk about cell architecture. So why in the world, how did you get there? What's the problem you're trying to solve? Well, so let me take a first stab and then yeah. hand over to Sanka. So, so I, I love making microservices. It's really fun. You constrain the problem right down so you can build something really quickly, really effectively. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about the big picture. You just concentrate on building a really nice service. Uh, and, you know, I, I remember I did a hackathon. I was, I was doing my PhD and, and, um, Twilio sponsored a hackathon. So we were all doing SMS based apps. And I built this little weird app as a microservice architecture. And it was like really efficient. I was like, it was one of my earliest sort of real microservices things. And I was like, this, this is really fun. But then you build a few microservices and suddenly you just got a nightmare. It's just an explosion of complexity. And so the problem I, you know, that Asanka and I were trying to solve when we started talking about this was really how do you how do you get the benefits of, of building microservices, running microservices, uh, that simplicity, especially when you have a, a, a substrate in which they run really well, uh, but you control the complexity. You somehow don't let it just explode. So does does that is there more you want to add to that Sanka? yeah so uh, i think i'll a little bit explain on how uh, we got to that point uh, so it was uh, 2017 december that uh, i got invited to speak at o'reilly architecture conference the cfe i submitted um, was about iterative architecture that's something sanjeeva paul we discussed some time back and uh, in my slide deck uh, i had a slide about uh, that i call segmented architecture uh, based on the uh the uh like the information we got from the customers and a certain set of deployments i put it as a segmented architecture and for some coincidence paul was um, visiting sri lanka uh, during that time and i uh, uh, we met at a coffee shop and then i went through the slide deck with paul then once we get into that segmented architecture slide he said there's something in this and uh, the conference uh, supposed to be in London as well. Then we decided, okay, we should meet uh, after the conference. So I went, presented uh, this thing, got really good feedback from the uh, uh, the audience as well about the iterative architecture. Then uh, we sat together and then uh, went through that segmented architecture concept. If you look at uh, what AWS is calling cell-based architecture is what we had in that particular slide that you just um, group some workloads and you have a router that uh, dispatch the workloads into these small um, uh, group of uh, workloads. So 
that's how everything started i think the problem uh, that uh, as uh, paul explained was that people were writing microservices and then at the same time this concept of the death star came into the picture from uber that thousand of microservices running inside the infrastructure you don't know uh, what are the dependencies and how these things communicate so it started becoming a problem and then uh, uh, that's why i think we thought okay we need to find a solution for this particular problem before it becomes a real problem for the enterprises so i think uh, that's where everything got started awesome so a uh, yeah and certainly that that's a very real problem that many people have had to deal with which is having all these moving parts and not being able to understand the macro view of it how what's the inspiration to go into this concept of a cell you know cell obviously has a biological angle or so, yeah uh, well, so, how did you so, get how you guys end up so there? i have to blame my daughter for part of this because my daughter studied biology at the university and she she was doing cell stuff and i kind of got a little bit interested and i and we were looking at you know the the boundaries we were looking at the how do you how you resolve problems as you create solid boundaries so you you encapsulate dependencies together and and if you look at biological cells they encapsulate a lot of function behind a, a membrane a cell a cell barrier and they have very limited uh communications across that barrier so basically there's intracellular communications which are which are there are receptors on the outside of the cell and those receptors only respond to certain chemical signals and pass those through and vice versa so they pass signals out of the cell as well and 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 i i think there was that then there's also this visual thing you know cells typically if you look at a picture of cells you see you see these self-contained blobs and they contain function and and so that's really some of the inspiration um did did you want to yeah. add to that yeah so the, uh, it's correct so we got the concept of this um, isolated uh, islands uh, then we were looking for um, a name for that i think we thought of a jail uh, some kind of a way that how you can name it uh, at the same time paul was like really interested about the biology system biology type of concepts so that's how we end up with the uh, cell architecture even the, so the name for uh, the cell architecture and even i can remember when we define the concept at like very early stage um we kind of socialize it with the internal group and sanjeev you were there on the audience and i think uh, you said this looks like um, rebel groups that are fighting with each other i, I, I have much more I, much for vivid memory of their presentations <laughs> two of you guys are presenting uh, uh, uh tyler was there yeah and i was at the back at that it was yeah. at the uh, colombo um, hilton hilton yes and moment after you presented that i i raised my hand and said this is the terrorist cell architecture <laughs> i did use the word i used i know you don't want to use that but i'm not particularly correct so it was a terrorist cell architecture it was like we're completely isolated yeah, was, you yeah. know you can blow away a cell but the other cells continue yeah. kind yeah. of model right so. Yeah. so so i but i i just want to add something which is that you know when i was young i hated biology I, i was like <laughs> this is far too complex it's too weird i liked physics i like maths because they're clear cut every you know when you go into physics exam you can just work everything out from first principles yeah. right in a biology exam you front. have to know so much stuff and i was like and when my daughter was going to do biology i was no don't do it you have to learn so much don't do it do physics do physics and she but you know when you get into enterprise computing you quickly realize everything is complex complexity is just inherent you talk to customers you talk to you look at yeah. systems there's just so much complexity everywhere and i think that's why biology is so important because it's the study of complexity it's trying to deal with complexity and so i think you know while your terrorist cell <laughs> analogy has a lot of has a lot of validity it's actually i think we can learn a lot from biology mm. and so i think you know and if you actually look at how cells work uh there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot to learn for cell based architecture yeah about the way the boundaries are formed the way that uh, systems work inside the cell and if you think about it everything in life every bit of living 
material is made up of cells, whether it's plants or animals. And if you didn't have cells, we'd just be like a, a big blob of goo, right? You know, we'd just be a whole pile of molecules lying around. It's the cells that give any structure to life. And, and those structures are so important. So I, I think it's a really, it's a really interesting analogy. And I think it's a deeper nut. You know, yeah. the, that's the thing about biology is you can take these lessons and learn really deep lessons from it. Whereas physics and, and maths are very lovely, but nothing, nothing in the real world is that simple. So, so they, they tend, you tend to come up with simplistic analogies and, and models. Whereas I think biology tends you to, come up with complex powerful models that actually fit better yeah. into real world problems yeah and when did the research as well during that time during that research like uh, we identified in computer science there wasn't any thing related to uh, this uh, but in the telco world there was a concept called sales but it's completely different okay. there are some uh, parallels but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't exactly what we were trying to do here as well as there are a few concepts in biology like uh, in a cell there is a membrane and then some of the cell concepts nicely map to that yeah. so that was yeah, the motivation right. so yeah. so so we'll, we'll come back to uh, more biological analogies but uh, let, let's so we've talked about this thing called cell-based architecture what the hell is it what does it do for me why don't you start this time and i will uh, yeah so i think uh, uh, my um, uh, kind of uh, position for that is uh, cell-based architecture is a combination of application and deployment architecture style because um, there was a gap when it comes to project development. Uh, uh, architect design something and developer develop something slightly different from the what architect design. And then uh, a deployment, a, dev a DevOps engineer or a platform engineer, they go and deploy a complete different thing from that architect design so that's why like uh, when it comes to this concept uh, we thought that it has to be a combination of application architecture and uh, uh, the deployment architecture so that way you can take that uh, design architecture by an architect um, same way to the development and then to deployment so there is no surprises happening uh, when it comes to this entire uh, design and development process so um, in high level it's a combination of application and uh, uh, deployment architecture so uh, again it's about uh, how you properly design a distributed architecture and then how you can properly deploy it and then maintain it in a longer run is where uh, these architecture concepts are coming and helping uh, uh, Paul do you have anything to add? Yeah so so I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it and it's really important so a cell is basically a set of microservices that communicate together. And within the cell, you can have any communication you want. It, it can be message-based, it can be RPC-based, it can be uh, RESTful, it can be any, any kind of sockets, anything. Any kind of communication, any end-to-end, any, any -end, so any, any microservice can communicate with any microservice within the cell. Outside the cell, you have to have a clear boundary. So outside the cell, you need some gateway. Now that gateway may support a messaging interface. It may support a, a RESTful interface. It may support a, a RPC interface, but it has to be a very clearly defined interface. And more importantly than what it exposes is what it hides. It hides everything apart from the few things that you expose. So that. That's the kind of basic concept of the cell. And then as Asanka says, the idea is that these, these components, these interfaces, it, it matches. So the architecture, the application architecture is defined as a set of cells that communicate with clearly defined interfaces and a set of microservices within those cells. So there's two levels of architecture and you could possibly have multiple levels, but let's just stick to two for the moment. So you have the internal architecture and the external architecture, and then you have a matching development strategy. So you, you build these microservices together and people know about them, and you have a matching deployment. But even more importantly, you have to tie this into the teams. So the, the whole point of those microservices can all talk to each other. They have to be owned by the same team. 
because this is one of the big problems is, is team boundaries uh, are just as important as technical boundaries. So if someone inside the team wants to change one of those microservices, everybody in the, in, within the cell, every, all the other developers of services in the cell have to know about that, right? Now, if you're in the same team, you, you mention it in the stand-up, you communicate, you deal with it. If you're outside that team, that's when the communication problems become really difficult. So that's why you need to have a well-defined version interface at the cell boundary, but within the cell, you get the free-for-all. So within the cell, you have a team that can be really efficient. They can work really fast. They can change things. They can break things as long as they, as long as they give the outside world the same service interface, the same interface, the, it's fine. Um, and so you get all that freedom and, and joy of making microservices and being quick and agile. And then outside, you have a different boundary. So that's, that's kind of the thing. But basically, it's just a set of services communicating freely within the cell and then having a very clearly defined interface outside the cell. And as Asanka says, matching that to the organization, to the team, to the and, and across the development life cycle, across the architecture, development, DevOps, all the way through fit. So really cool. Exactly. So if I if I take a um so so you guys are saying there are actually all three aspects. There's the application architecture, there is the deployment architecture, there's the people architecture. Yeah. yeah. All three are kind of represented or encapsulated within the scope of a cell. Yes. And the cell has a contract that it publishes. Yes. So it's kind of like a module. If I take a programming language analogy. Yes. Right. So there is a big sync up with domain driven design. Right. And there are uh, similar concepts in, in, in object oriented programming. The difference is that there, those are tightly coupled interfaces into a single, into a single address program, space as well. A single right? address space, a yeah. single program. So there is, I mean, you know, this isn't all new, you know, there's the of lots of history. Of course, there's, of course. you know, there's loads, as you say, there's segmented architecture, there's Amazon's, uh, there's lots of people doing similar things. I think, I think the, the really, the, the really powerful thing about this is that sync synchronization and trying to align the people architecture, the application architecture, the deployment architecture. So trying to sort of, bring people into the equation at the same time as solving this problem. Right. And and if I understand the architecture correctly, you don't have cells within cells. No. So no. it's not a recursive model. So recursive what's the thinking model. behind that? Because that's kind of non-computer science thing to do. So uh, I, I have no problem with cells within cells. When we discussed this a few years ago, we were just like, you you can create problems by being too clever. Yes. And we felt that that was maybe being too clever and, and running before you can walk and, and definitely a case of Yagni. You know, mm. maybe we'll need it, maybe we won't, but yeah. but let's not let's not do that until we actually need it. And mm. uh, you know, I haven't I'm not that involved in the in the deployment, in the real world deployment of this. I've, I've been doing other things, but um my guess is you probably still don't need it yet. And that's a few years. Yeah. So. so it's interesting because I think we discussed it um, in Dubai. Uh, so I can't call that project <laughs> a special name project that we <laughs> It's true, an internet computer for Kubernetes. Exactly. So after that the discussion, um, we uh, spoke about this thing um, about having these uh, cells inside cells. So I think uh, one thing was the cyclic dependencies uh, to avoid it um, as well as if somebody wants to make the cell more immutable then uh, cell inside cell might be um, uh, mm -hmm. making it really complicated uh, so those were the kind of uh, semantics okay. that we discussed but I, I think there's another way of looking at this which is that you know sure if if you're a development group and you want to build up some cells within your cell as a team do what you like. Yeah. You, any, within the cell, anything goes, and that could include mm. more cells, mm. right? That's your problem. The, but, but building multi layers into the application architecture, I think, is getting away from you know the the, the pure idea of you know trying to trying to build a a straightforward application architecture. Now, of course, in biology, you do get organs which are made up of cells. So an organ is kind of, it doesn't have a well-defined boundary, but it does have a set of cells that 
form together, clump together to create a function. Right. But it, it but it's know, not it a has cell a leaky, anymore. It's not a yeah. cell and it has a yeah. leaky boundary. Mm. So, so the heart has lots of different inputs and outputs. It doesn't have a, you know, it doesn't have a well-defined membrane that protects it from everything right. else. So, you know, I think, I think probably that that, you know, it's better to say that, you know, that's your problem. If you want to do cells within cells, that's fine. But at the application architecture, there's just a straightforward, well-defined right. set of cells. Yeah. And, and I think also, you know, it's like, it's like organizations, you know, you don't want your organization to get too top heavy, too multi-level. You know what I mean? Flatter organizations tend to be more efficient. So okay. I think there's also yeah. a human aspect to it as well. And the grouping of cells is okay. And I think even the spec, uh, we are speaking about um, a virtual application as a concept. So if somebody wants to group a set of cells for a specific purpose, they can mm. do that as well. That's okay. kind of like an organ, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so the I think uh, uh, the biology analogy is, is a good answer also, right? To say, look, we've created all this massively complicated not we've created but yeah nature has created Nature's all these massively crazy. complicated things that work that work perfectly <laughs> fine and yeah. they don't seem to have cells in cells yeah so it works perfectly exactly. fine right? yeah so so let me let me touch on the biology side a little bit uh, which also connects to that whole iterative architecture side um, evolution enterprise software as we all know is never done and dusted ever it's always evolving and a and to build an architecture and a system that can evolve is extremely difficult. Um, so iterative architecture is advocating that you shouldn't aim for the end state. Yeah. Do what you can do now, but leave the room to iterate architecturally in addition to just the, the scope of the function, right? Uh, how does cell architecture support in terms of evolutionary behavior of a, of a system that you have to do in, in a real complex situation? Yeah, so I think uh, there's like multi-level of agility coming with this architecture because now you have the components and then you can redesign, rewrite the components and then you have the cells. Then you can redesign and um, uh, redeploy the cells as well. So really the cell, then you look at the cell as kind of a contractual obligation with its neighborhood. Exactly. exactly. And... And then you can version it and yeah. then the interface um, in like uh, uh, implementation terms, it's an API, right? It can be different uh, type of a protocol, but then you can version it. And at the same time, now, if you take as an example, we call customer cell. So customer cell can have two versions running at a time as well in some instances because uh, the interface that uh, we are providing might be using by certain set of applications and then uh, you might can uh, use it for a while and then deprecate it while you are doing this new implementation in another cell and provide a new interface for application developers as well so like that like you get a lot of um, flexibility uh, how you can change the architecture without affecting the running systems. I think when it comes to enterprise, I think that's where we are addressing this uh, uh, solution for the problems that they are facing, right? The key problem is you can't do the innovation or you can't do the optimization because there are a lot of dependencies with uh, the systems that they have built. So having these isolated uh, um, uh, work, group, uh, work units will help them to change stuff quickly and then uh, uh, have more agility within the enterprise. Yeah, I think that's. I think I think you've said it all there, really. But I just want to kind of put it in a different light, which is that cell architecture is inherently based on service-oriented architecture yeah. concepts and API-oriented concepts. So, so cells have well-defined APIs and SLAs, and, and most importantly, versions. Yeah. So. So that's that's the foundation of making it an iterative ev evolutionary architecture that allows you to evolve it. So you know when we're not you know we're not trying to say that it replaces those things. It absolutely builds on top of those concepts, and that's absolutely key to 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 the to the success of it. And I think that you know that's there's you know let's go back to biology. You know 
we, we lose our cells and they get replaced, right? Yeah. They die and new cells take new their function takes over. and yeah. takes over. So, and sometimes those, those things don't do it exactly and sometimes the same they don't way. take over. They, they, they don't <laughs> seem to want to work anymore. They don't, they don't work. And that's <laughs> unfortunate. But yeah. So, so, so there's, uh, I think there's, and then those cells have well defined functions yeah. now, you know, and, and I, th I think, you know, so that's one big part of it. And then the other big part of it is that you have to tie it to the human organization. You have to make sure that the, the human teams are also willing to evolve and iterate and, change and, and add new yeah. function and change versions so so you know i think i think it's really important to keep coming back to that human side of this because you know i think that's one of the problems is that we tended to build architectures uh, as mathematical constructs you know we tended to to build everything as beautiful maths rather than thinking about the human interactions yeah. and, and i think that's when you run into politics then you run into <laughs> politics and human things and all those challenges exactly so so really key yeah yeah. Great. Maybe we, we can talk a little bit about implementation. You know, okay. cell architecture is a concept. Yes. How do I use it? Right. Okay. So I think we, we have in WSRU, we have two iterations we've done on this one. One was Celery, and now we have it in Curio. Yeah. So, so, so Celery is a project we did a few years ago yeah. and, and we deprecated. And I think it was a really, yeah, I, 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 you know, with the hindsight, it's really nice to look at like what were the good aspects of Celery and what were the, things we didn't do right. And then maybe I'll switch the tables around and ask you guys about what you're <laughs> doing now with Corio. So Celery was, I think, a, a, a beautiful demonstration, like a prototype of what cell architecture could be. And I, I think the really good thing was it showed cell architecture in its entirety. So it showed versioning, interfaces, uh, it showed uh, the, the the going from application architecture with designing the application through a graphical tool all the way to deployment and managing and DevOps and doing versions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those things that made it a lovely prototype made it not work in reality. So all those things, we put all our best ideas into one system mm -hmm. um, uh, and it, an end-to-end -end system. And the reality is that you know, in real life, no one's, you know, that, that's very hard to adopt. Do you know what I mean? You have to be all in. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think if we, we, you know, I think Celery's downfall was it's, it put everything in one basket. Um, but it, if you do want to, un, you know, the docs and it's all on GitHub. So if you do want to just see what a kind of a, a pure vision of cell architecture would be, it's a nice place to go look. Um, but it's not necessarily a good real world tool to take. So, so I'm going to switch now and ask you, Sanjeeva. So, so, you know, you've been really involved in building cell architecture into Corio. Firstly, why don't you tell us what Corio is, and then we can um, uh, understand how cell architecture fits okay. into it. So Corio, Corio is a platform we are building to address pretty much the same problem, which is how do I support a bunch of people getting together and building an architecture and deploying it and managing it from the point of writing a line of code, checking it in, all the way into running it in modern cloud native infrastructure. By the way, I should add, Paul is the one who termed the term, who came up with the term cloud native. <laughs> Paul wrote a blog about it in 2016, maybe? Yeah, maybe. Something More like back, that. Yeah, 14, Defining what cloud native yeah, is. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we have lots of uh, okay, yeah, claims uh, to fame here. That's that. another yeah. one of those, <laughs> yes. So, but yeah, so, so Corio is basically trying to take the same kind of complexity that we deal in the enterprise, which is I have a bunch of people, I'm trying to do a bunch of things, I'm trying to reuse, I'm trying to do all this. You know, we, we talk about microservices architecture, domain-driven architecture, uh, automation of DevOps pipelines, all of these things that you have to do in order to be a cool digital native business. Uh, Corio kind of tries to, I don't want to say dumb it down, it doesn't dumb anything down, kind of deliver it in a consumable form for everybody. Is that, is that what you call an internal developer platform? Internal developer platform okay. it is. Basically, so a, write the code and nothing from writing the code to deploy into a zero trust environment, running in multiple environments, version managed, observed, all of that. 
uh, free of charge. And of course, all with an API-centric architecture. Absolutely. It's the services, the fundamental services concept is the underlying mechanism. And it's really, it's a, so in Corio, we have this set of abstractions. We have an abstraction of an organization, which is kind of your organization. And we will be adding organizations, having sub-organizations kind of have an org hierarchy structure that you can maintain if you want. And eventually you get to a set of projects. And we chose to map a project to a cell. So every project has basically a set of components, which is the same yeah. term as a celery, yeah. cell architecture component. Yeah. And some of those components, and within the project, the components can see each other and do whatever they want, yeah. no governance involved. Yeah. Uh, but if you are exposing yourself outside, we, we would, we've taken it one step further in, in cell architecture. At the heart of it, it just says, talks about uh, sort of a external exposure. So in, in enterprise architecture, we've taken it to inside the enterprise external versus external external. Right. But otherwise, it's exactly the thing. same thing in salary. Okay. So, so, Great. So, so, so exact so same, same idea, architecture. Yeah. But we don't, we're trying to deliver it to you without really con trying to convince you to practice cell architecture. It's a little bit of a uh, you know Trojan horse. So so what you're saying is it's just a natural organizational exactly. It's, it's exactly. There's no sort of like you must have cell architecture. It's just a natural. This is how to organize your project. Right. It, it's yeah. just you know it's nature, right? Yeah. This is nature. Yeah. You know it's like there's yeah. a, there's that cartoon. I can't remember. There's some cartoon where you know one fish is uh, swimming uh, downstream and the other one is fishing upstream. And I think it's the the downstream guy fishing upstream saying, how's the water up there? Right? <laughs> and the fish is like, what's water? Because fish just know there's no water, right? Water yeah. is yes. the entire environment. Yeah. So it's that's the analogy here, that cell architecture is a natural architecture. So we're trying to, so this yeah. is, so Trojan and horse is kind I of- guess, a, I guess, yeah. I think Trojan horse is maybe a sort of a, yeah, a it, wrong term for it. But I think what you're trying to say is that the choreo just has a set of, Givens that everything's uh, service oriented, everything's managed and versioned, yeah. APIs, yeah. Uh, cells, and cloud native, and deployed in a scalable, monitorable DevOps way. So, so there's just a whole load of things that are taken for granted, and cell architecture is one of those, which is yes, is a really good model. Yeah, uh, cell architecture I would say is not just sort of just one of those. Cell architecture is really central because it's around that that we have built this experience. Mm -hmm. cool. It's the versioning architecture. It's the, the environment with which we create this sort of uh, marketplace. So when you go to the, when you're within a component, if you go to the marketplace, uh, when you're working on one component, you, if you say, I want to see what's visible to me within my project, you'll see that list. If you want to see what's in the organization, you'll see that list. If you want to see what's available from third parties. Uh, so I think uh, there's a, a latest version of the cell architecture paper also talks about uh, both um, exposure fr from the cell contract perspective, both what it offers as well as what it consumes. Right? It was in the original That's yeah, architecture original as well, spec, right? Yeah. So, so we, 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 we yeah. again, we have, so we have that explicitly in the, in, in Corio as well. And uh, just to right. remind Sanjeeva, we, we want to put this in WSDL about 20 yes. years ago. Yes. We wanted to say, you should be able to say what you need as well as what you offer. Yes. And... That was a, that was a, you know, so eventually, eventually good ideas come back, right? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Give uh, it long, fact, enough, long enough and yes, <laughs> good in ideas. Fact, uh, yeah. in, in BPL, BPL yeah, yeah. for WS, there is a thing, there's a concept of my port type and your port type. Yes. And partner yeah. links. Yeah, yeah. Which is very, very much cool. similar I concept as well. I remember well. those. Yes. Yeah, really yes. nice. It's really component-based thinking, right? Yes. And, and, and those uh, are, th those are, uh, appear in Eric Evans' DDD book as well. Yes. So, the blue book talks about those things as well, but you know, not. It, I, I think that the the challenge is to make those work with the people, with the organization, with the scale. And it right. sounds like that that's one of the things. Maybe that's. I think what I'm hearing about Corio that's really powerful is it's not just an IDP. It's an IDP with this concept of the people architecture, the application architecture, the deployment architecture in sync. Yes. So. And so you're building all three of those when you when you use it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah really and powerful. and I think maybe we can uh, Sanka, maybe you can talk a little bit about the um, the software engineering, the application architecture part of it, because the deployment architecture is what most IDP products cover. Yes. So DevOps pipeline, zero trust deployment, they cover that. Most of them don't 
think about the application architecture. They don't have a cell architecture. They don't have a gateway architecture. They don't so, try and solve those bigger problems. Uh, right. How do you structure and, and exactly. scale enterprise yeah. architecture? Yeah. Which, which is which is uh, which is one of the big challenges. Which is a <laughs> big challenge. I mean, <laughs> DevOps. Big, big you know, I mean, no, no disrespect to the other products. The DevOps automation and given that is fantastic. Yeah. But it, it's, you know, in my view, it's 20% of the problem. 80% of yeah. the problem is how do you get people to collaborate? How yes. do you get them to work together? Yeah. How do you get them to reuse? How do you get them to discipline their architecture so other people can control yeah. it, right? Yeah. So maybe we can talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. so that, um, as Sanju explained, so we are addressing two uh, problems. One is this uh, traditional um, uh, definition of IDP describes about uh, how you can have a seamless uh, delivery and uh, uh, an operational uh, practice embedded into a platform. So what we did extended it, okay, try to ad address the entire problem an organization uh, trying to solve from the uh, application design into application architecture development and then into deployment. So that's where the uh, software engineering related practices we introduce into Corio. Um, so our definition of uh, internal developer platform, it contains two things. One is this um, uh, operational efficient efficiency and then the uh, software engineering related capabilities. Uh, so that's where like uh, we have addressed both problems. Um, and if you look at the market, there are a bunch of uh, other um, internal developer platforms like the backstage uh, um, and harness those kind of stuff available but those are addressing that uh, operational aspect of the problem so that's where we are trying to address the uh, other part as well bringing these uh, concepts like iterative architecture we explained uh, earlier and then the domain driven design type of concepts api first approach um, and then how you can have a zero trust environment all these things are bundled together in a single platform um, uh, when it comes to a core as an internal developer platform so the the um, so cell based architecture we are using it in two levels one is uh, for the consume of the platform they get uh, it by default when they create a project and uh, start building components inside that project in addition to that uh, we re-architected the uh, control plane of uh, Corio recently. Uh, so it has this architecture contains a control plane and a data plane. So now we are using cell based architecture to um, uh, develop the control plane as well. Uh, so it's kind of uh, a really good thing because now we can use it to do that level of uh, implementations as well, not only application that's, level that's implementations. That's really cool. I yeah. mean, I, there's obviously eating your own dog food and that's a great example of that. Exactly. So I, I guess we're running out of time, but it would seems to me that this is a really good point, you know. So I want to, you know, one of the things that's really nice about cell-based architecture is not just a WSO2 thing, right? There's all sorts of people using it. So Excellent. why don't we just give a couple of examples and, yeah. and find out where people can get more information on, okay. on third parties using cell-based architecture and how they're using yeah. it. Yeah, so when it comes to implementation, Okta is using uh, cell-based architecture and they have published a paper and uh, booking.com, they are using cell-based architecture to run their uh, infrastructure. And in addition to that, um, Uber came up with something called DOMA, uh, Domain-Oriented Microservice Architecture, again, inherited from uh, cell-based architecture uh, so like that uh, we see like third-party implementations and in addition to that a lot of WSO2 customers they are using uh, uh, cell-based architecture uh, to uh, define their infrastructure architecture as well as the application architectures those are a few examples uh, yeah I mean I, th I think you know this is a uh, so so uh, one thing that occurs to me when you're talking about this so, so obviously you don't need to use Corio or any system to to build yep. this, you can yep. build this up yep. as Kubernetes resources with gateways and yep. services and versioning. So there's or, or other cloud platforms, and of course you can also use Corio badly. You could create one service per project and and, <laughs> and do it wrong, or you could create all You're your services available. in one project in one service right. in one project, but yep. everything in one project. So yep. so you can always mess things up, right? Absolutely. So so I think this is this is. One of the things that you learn from looking at Uber and Booking.com and various WSO2 customers is that, you know, there's always good practice. 
And, and this is as much about what you do with it as, as what infrastructure there is to help you do it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I think, uh, I think Asanka, you're doing a presentation at uh, CNCF KubeCon yes. this yeah. year with the Booking Doctor team. Exactly. In Salt so Lake I think City. that'll be interesting for people to listen to exactly. if they want to, if they're so going to see it. Uh, cool. cool. So, yeah. 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 So yeah, I, I think Paul, we, uh, maybe what you said is a very important point and uh, we should discuss that a few minutes and wrap up around it, which is that, you know, you can build an architecture and all these tools and so forth, but you can always mess it up uh, by using an approach in a way that is not the way it's meant to be. Put all everything into one cell doesn't do any good. Basically, there's no discipline, there's no control, there's no monitoring. Put them, put each one into a separate cell. Does does you no know, good because you don't get the benefit of yeah. collaboration. Or, or you so. just, or you just don't align your team boundaries with cells. Right. And you have different people from different teams creating services within a cell, and then you don't have the stand up, you don't have the communications. Yeah. They they mess each other yeah. up. So you know, there's always ways to mess this up, and I think that's one of the things that I think really resonate uh, you know you said it right at the beginning of this podcast you've got to align the different aspects of your of your organization and architecture together to make this work yep all right well guys it's been a wonderful exploration of cell-based architecture that was, that was pretty cool we didn't digress too much no no we, a we kept a little bit of uh, wisdom and yeah you know, <laughs> a bit uh, here and there we, but if we keep it completely straight and narrow that'll be that, that's be boring yeah yes. <laughs> So, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Asanka. Uh, it's been really fun uh, catching up together on yeah. something that you... Uh, and, and thank you for creating such a fantastic architecture. It is the anchor of WSO2's future technology platform in many, many ways. Yeah. And uh, wow. lovely to see you. Brilliant to be back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Paul, Cheers. for joining uh, oh, the podcast. Thanks. And I think I would like to add one more thing. These type of uh, concepts are coming from uh, first principle thinking. I think we should talk about it in a later podcast. Um, first principle thinking and then set of people who think the right way, uh, resulting mm -hmm. these type of uh, good concepts. That's right. You get good solutions when you go and have clarity on what problem you're trying to exactly. solve. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very important. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.